Morning, church. Okay, our reading is coming from Titus 2, verse 11 to 15. And it reads, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation of, for all people, in instruction, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust, and to live a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good, eager to do good works. Proclaim these things and encourage Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Listen up. The grace of God saves us. The grace of God sanctifies us. The grace of God sustains us. You are never beyond the need of God's grace. And you are never beyond the reach of God's grace. Look at this quote of Martin Luther. We experience God's grace in three ways. Once for all. How beautiful was that moment of salvation. Again and again, day after day, and more and more. The more we get to know it, the deeper it gets, the more profound our experience, and the more we find ourselves swimming in this ocean of God's grace. How amazing is God's grace. Our theme for today is an easy one, amazed by grace. Question, are you amazed by God's grace? Think about question of the day and the stuff we just shared. It is an experience we have which has an impact on us. Something changed in you and around you when you experienced your moment of amazement in the past two weeks. You definitely shared it with someone, somehow, because that is what we do when we have amazing experiences. Is that true of your experience of God's grace? Because if you experience God's grace, you will experience it as amazing. And it has the same effect on us as our amazing experiences we had or we shared in our question of the day. Why do we need to talk about God's grace in the context of Titus? Let me show you. So the Christian way of life, read the heading, is based on God's generous grace. In Crete, as in Pretoria, as in Rustenburg, as in Cape Town, as in New York City, as in London, there were opposing voices. Culture on the one hand and the gospel on the other. And people in between these two voices having to make a decision. The Lordship of Jesus Christ bowing the knee and submitting to His authority versus YOLO. YOLO is short for you only live once. It's the experience of life saying, I can do whatever I want, how much ever I want to do it. And in the middle you see that God's grace is demonstrated in Jesus' redeeming death for His enemies. And that calls people to a new way of life. Because God's grace saves us. We just mentioned that S. God's grace sanctifies us. It changes us. We'll get to that now. God's grace sustains us. And we have to choose between these two opposing voices. 
what life we want to live. Now, let's just back up a second here. We are in a series currently called Transforming Culture. We are working through Paul's letter to Titus, and we are asking two key questions as we go. How can Christians wisely participate in culture in order to transform it for the common good? It's a great question. That's why we hear, amongst other things. Second question, how can our lives make the teaching about God our Savior, we refer to it as the gospel, attractive? We've said in the beginning of the series that the church should be an agent of transformation, not through culture wars or through assimilating with culture, but through wise participation in culture. And we started the series by saying, as we read through the book of Titus, we will see that our devotion to Jesus and our devotion to the common good will show the beauty of the message about our saving God. I think it's time for a definition. I like this one. A definition of culture. What are we talking about here when we talk about that that needs to be transformed? Look at it. Culture can be defined as all the ways of life, including arts, beliefs, and institutions of a population that are passed down from generation to generation. Culture has been called the way of life of an entire society. As such, it includes codes of manners, dress, language, religion, rituals, and art. I'm going to ask you a question, but I don't want you to raise your hand. Are you happy with how things are at the moment, if you think of our culture? I'm not saying that culture is all bad, but I am saying that culture can't be all good. And the gospel gets lived out in the church and the Christian culture in a way that it influences culture outside the church. Think about it. A lot of our cultural experiences bring division among us and not unity. A lot of our cultural experiences create suspicion about the other. A lot of things in our culture create us humans uh, to be disregarding towards other people. Sometimes our culture hurts us. We can't be happy with how things are around us because these are the things that come from human culture and our differences in culture. And that's why we need to transform it. And that's why we need to transcend it. I'll get there now. Well, let me... Say it the other way around. Imagine a culture that is based on service. Imagine a culture of grace. Imagine a culture of love and forgiveness, compassion and acceptance. Imagine a culture of sacrifice. That's Christian culture. And that's what we ought to live. And that's how we ought to transform the culture outside. Our transcultural definition says we want to reflect, embrace, and enjoy the diversity of our context. We honor that. And it's, a, it's given by God to us, and He created this diversity. But it's not all good, and it needs to change. And that's why the rest of our definition says, by the power of the gospel, we want to transcend this. We want to move beyond it. We want to rise above it to what? Create one new community in Christ. That's what we dream about. That's what we're here for. The Christian way of life can bring about this transformation. And it starts with being amazed by God's grace. And remembering what it did, does, and will do for me. Let me pray for us as we jump into the scriptures that we will be amazed by God's grace this morning. Father God, we sang that we can see the love in your eyes. And that's grace. We sang that where your spirit is, there's freedom. And that's grace. We sang about being empty-handed and broken and being put back together by your grace. That is amazing, Father God. The word amazing actually 
cannot explain the fullness of our emotion and our thoughts when we contemplate, reflect, and experience these things. We want to transform culture. We want to be faithful to you. And we want to do it in the way that you would have us do it. And therefore, Lord Jesus, I pray now, as we open up your scriptures, that we will be alert to your voice, that we will hear the prompting of your spirit clearly, that we will be strengthened, that we will be encouraged, that we will be inspired, that we will be humbled, and that we will respond to this word that you have for us. Help us to focus on you now. Help us to leave the last six days in the past. Help us to leave the next six days in the future. Help us to be present in this moment and to know that your grace is sufficient for us. We pray that in your name. Amen. Let's take them one by one. We started by saying the grace of God saves us. So let's look at verse 11. So we're going to uh, go verse by verse and point by point. And then obviously the bold and underline uh, additions is for you to focus on what we are busy with. I said this last week, but I said it quickly. And I thought that I'm going to say it again. If you would draw up a list of all known world religions, and you have to categorize them into two categories. I need to do something or it was done for me, you'll end up with a really lopsided shuffle or organization. Because all known religions, except Christianity, is based on something that you do. And something that you have to do. You can only be in the right with this God you serve if you do certain things. Not talking down on other known religions, stating the fact. And then on this side, you have, it is done. And you are in the right, through faith, by God's mercy and His grace. And there's only one religion that sits on this side, and it's called Christianity. That is a fact. There is no more compelling case to make for why Christianity is unique, it's worth exploring, it's worth accepting, and it's worth living. Because it comes from a place of fullness and abundance and grace. And you cannot fall out of favor with your God because if He looks at you, He sees His Son. Pure and blameless. Done. You can explore this all you want. You will be found wanting because you are going to fail. You can fail all you want on this side. It will not Change God's love and mercy for you. That's what it means. The grace of God has appeared. It's personified. It's described as a human being because it's in Jesus Christ. And that saved us. Period. In the perfect sense. It is done. The grace of God saves us. I've mentioned that it's personified. I think it's important to mention that. Why? Because a person is someone you experience. It's not something you think. And I think that's our fundamental problem if we think of Christianity in light of other religions is we keep it all in here. If it was supposed to be kept all in here, then it would have said the grace of God came into our heads. But it didn't. It came as a human being to be seen and to be experienced. Jesus Christ hung on a cross, naked, with arms open, ready to embrace, full of blood, on His way to die. Look at me. See my love. Experience it. Be saved. I mean, I can think about my wife all I want. But the actual embrace and feeling her and experiencing her is vastly different than thinking about her. 
the grace of God came to be experienced through Jesus for all people. That's the best news ever. Because you see, if you draw up this list of world religions, they would all be described as exclusive. If you look at the one on this side, it is inclusive. All means all, that all means, and that means all. I didn't make that up. I heard that once, it stuck with me, and I just threw it out here. It's not on my notes, though. But that's important for us to know. For all people. Okay, so how does this salvation happen? We'll get to it when we get to verse 14. Let's look at the second one. The grace of God sanctifies us. Definition of sanctified. The action of making or declaring something holy. The action of making or declaring something holy. Holy means set apart. Set aside for special use. Think about it. You guys would visit my house. I would say, pretend like it's yours and make yourself at home. And I'm speaking the truth. But you can't go and get in my bed. Like, that's holy. Because that's where my wife and I sleep. Do you know what I mean? Like, our kids don't even sleep in our bed because they sleep in their own bed. So, make yourself at home. But there are certain things that you just don't do. Because it's set apart. That's what sanctified means. Now the grace of God sanctifies us. And how it sanctifies us is it helps us to say no to sin. And it helps us to say yes to God. This is really, really important. This might sound like fundamental Christianity to you. But we need to remember this. Repentance means turning. From this to this. So at the same time, I am saying no to something. I knew Christianity sat here earlier. I'm not saying no to Christianity at the moment. New metaphor. I'm saying no to something. And I'm saying yes to something else. And sanctification means saying no to sin and saying yes to God. I've used this illustration before, but let me use it again. I am a distance runner. And I am running at the moment. And by God's grace, I'll be running comrades again next year. For 2021, I wasn't a distance runner. I was a mountain biker. So I said no to running. And I turned and I said yes to cycling. And then I had to get onto a bicycle. And I had to put on cleats. And I had to get a chamois. And I had to get a helmet. And I had to actually get on it and do it. It wasn't enough to say, for the year 2021, I'm not going to be a runner. I'm going to be a cyclist and then do nothing. There's always action involved. And that changed everything for me. My training schedule changed. My diet changed. My gear changed. My whole understanding of sports and endurance had to change because it's a different sport than running. That's exactly what sanctification does in us. No to sin, yes to God. And the yes to God is important because our desires and passions are never neutral. They are never idle. They are going to get us to do something. And the question is, which way will you go? Because something you will do. Look at the words being used. Deny and love. Renounce and and pursue, those are, uh, those are two other words that we can use in this translation. So once again, it's by the grace of God, but what the grace of God does in us is it helps us to deny and to love. No and yes. And see that it is by the grace of God. I know last week's sermon was a really hard one. And it was very convicting. I want you to see in today's teaching text, which is still part of the same portion of Scripture, that it is God's grace that is at work in you. That will help you to live the sensible, righteous, righteous and godly way 
in this present age. It's not a special skill. It's not training you have to do. It's not a certificate that you have to be complete. It, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's something that is given to you by God. And the fact is, if God's grace is at work in you, this will be seen by you and by others. This sensible, righteous, and godly way of living. I think it's a great question for accountability and for spiritual growth. Why don't you ask your spouse, do you see these things in me? Why don't you ask your kids, your family, your men's group, your women's group, wherever it is that you get support in this Christian way of life? Question, how high is this on your list of priorities every single day? Because when we wake up, God's grace is new for us this morning, and the agenda is still the same. No to sin and yes to God, pursuing this kind of life and doing it by His grace. Do you ponder this when you wake up? Do you ponder this when you sit in traffic? Do you ponder this at lunch? Do you ponder this when you get home? Or do we wake up and we are completely overwhelmed by life's stuff? I need to remind you that this is of first importance because this is what we are called to be and to do. Third one, the grace of God sustains us. Look at verse 13. While we wait for the blessed hope, and what's the blessed hope? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. You and I are waiting for something to happen. The story isn't done. The story is still in motion. You've got creation. You've got the fall. You've got the story of God and Israel. I'm now walking through the Bible chronologically. You've got the stories about Jesus. And then you've got the church and the spirit. And then you've got the redemption or restoration of all things. This has not happened yet. So we are here. Number five. The story of the church and the spirit. We are in between. There are things that have happened already and things that have not yet happened. This is where we are. And we are waiting. Now here's the amazing thing. Jesus has revealed himself once, hasn't he? He came humbly, he lived a humble life, he died a shocking and humiliating death. He revealed himself to us as a human being, a Galilean carpenter, a Jewish man. That's what Christmas is all about, by the way. That's what we'll be singing about next Saturday. What we're waiting for now is the revelation of grace, but this time in glory. This time as a conquering king. This time when Jesus comes back, every single knee will bow before him because it will be undeniable that all the glory belongs to him. And this is what we have set our sights on, is that moment. And for that, we keep going now. That's where our motivation lies. Not in economic indicators. Not in bank balances, not in savings for one day, not in whoever you think you are or how you are presented to the world. Our hope lies in the finish. I just said that I'm a comrades athlete, so here comes a comrades illustration. I know while I run comrades that the finish line is getting closer with every single step. Every single step. Whether it is at a brisk pace, a slow, a slow pace or walking. The golden rule is do not stop. You can walk all you want. Walking isn't sin on comrades. But stopping will get you nowhere closer to the end. And it's exactly the same for us as Christians. We have everything we need to get to the end. And we need to keep going. When you get tired in comrades, especially in the last third, what you need to do is to open up your eyes to the things next to the road. Because that's what you need to get to the end. I mean, your legs are hurting. The sun is belting down on you. But there's water coming. 
And with the water, bananas. And after the bananas, some uh, oranges. And after the oranges, some potatoes. And after that, some energy, energy and energy bars, etc. It's all there. But while you are in this agony, you just have to keep your eyes open and keep going and receive what you need to get to the end. I've said this before, let me say it again. I will never be able to complete a comrade's marathon if there were not people next to the road. Never. But 100,000 people lining up over 90 kilometers gets you there. That's like grace. The race is still tough, but there's something else about the atmosphere and about the people next to the road, putting some wind in my sails and helping me to get to the end. That's what God's grace does for us. It sustains us. It gives us everything we need as we point towards the end. It gives us everything we need as our legs are hurting and we feel tired on this journey of faith. It cheers us on to keep going. Many times I have cried in the final fit of God. <laughs> when I'm so tired. And then someone looks you in the eye and they go, Go right now. Buddy, you're looking strong, eh? <laughs> Thanks, mate. And then you just go. We need that. That's what God's grace does for us. It saves us. It sanctifies us. And it sustains us. We have to have sentences that starts with, by God's grace we could, we did, we had, we will. That is how Christians ought to speak. And it all comes from outside of us. And it's guaranteed in abundance for the rest of our lives. Okay, so how and why did all of this happen? Because we started this portion of Scripture with the grace has appeared. So how did the grace appear? And why did the grace appear? Let's look at verse 14. He gave himself for us okay so let's stop there so that's how it happened substitution someone had to do it and we simply couldn't so he did someone had to pay brothers and sisters someone had to die and you and i couldn't so jesus said play me coach put me in there i'll sort it out and that's exactly what he did. He gave himself to redeem us. Because sin is a cosmic offense to a holy God and someone has to pay for it. That is a biblical fact. You can try and soften the word of sin and the meaning of sin all you want. It's a cosmic offense to a holy God. And you and I, if you are a Christian, praise God because in Jesus the price is paid. Done. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That verse in common vernac is the great switcheroo. There you go. From this side to this side, and from this side to this side, and switch. There we go. That's what Jesus did for us. He saves us from the penalty of sin. We covered that in verse 11, when we spoke about what we are being saved from. And He saves us from the power of sin. And that's really important for us to see. Look at this verse. To redeem us from what? From all lawlessness... And to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession. So we still experience sin. We still experience the effect and consequences of it, of it. But it does not have the power over us that it used to have when we were enslaved to it. That is a really, really important fact. Because if we submit to the slavery of sin... We will live as if we are still under the tyranny of it, even though we have been liberated. 
We sang this morning, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is bondage and slavery. That's not what we sang. We sang freedom. As we were singing this morning, Ava was on my shoulder. Oh, and we were working up a glorious sweat because the windows were still closed up there. And I heard her sing freedom, and I sang freedom, and I thought to myself, oh, Father God, just give me grace that I would live an example of this freedom to my kid. Because one day she's going to ask me, Dad, what does it mean that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom? And then I want to say to her, look at Dad's life. There's a lightness and a joy and a peace to my life because I don't have to pay for my sin. There was a moment. Killed me. It was a good moment. And then He doesn't only save us from the penalty of sin or from the power of sin. He saves us for something. And what is that for? To have a lack of life. To have all I want. To cruise and have my one-way ticket to heaven. No. He saved us for good works. That's what He saved us for. So said plainly, you are cleansed. That's a fact. You are His, that's a fact. You have a mission. And that will not change. Because it is done that you have been called for this mission. And now we get to do this. And that is amazing. Part of my worship experience this morning was just realizing that I get to do this. I get to do this. Guys, I wanted to be a chartered accountant. I studied accounting at Tux, wanting to teach business rescue in boardrooms. That's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to drive a Ferrari, have my own plane, be married to a blonde lady, and live in a Tuscan villa. I don't have any of those things. But I get to do this. I get to teach people about Jesus. I get to hear people's deepest desires of their hearts. I get to pray for people and support people and see them grow. I get to see kids raised. We get to plant a new church that's supposed to make a difference in this world. What can be better than that? I'm really amazed by it. But that was done by Jesus. And then he called me into it and I said yes. And that is an amazing privilege. If you're not cleansed, if you're not His, if you don't have a mission and a purpose, Come to Jesus. That's the invitation. Just come. Because His arms are open. And everything you need to be in a relationship with Him is given to you. We've been called for good works. Let's look at Matthew 5, 16. Oh, sorry, not, let's look at it. Let me read it to you. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's why we do good works. We don't do good works for likes on the socials. We don't do good works so that people can think we're cool. We do good works so that people can see the character of God on display. Period. Because that's what glory is all about. The glory of God that Jesus spoke of, why we should do good works, is about showing the character of God. And once again, we are empowered by grace to do it. Let me read you a really short jingle from the English Puritan writer and preacher, John Bunyan. There's a lot of Johns in the history of the church, I just realized. So this is another John. <laughs> Not John the Elder, but John Bunyan. He says, run, John, run, the law commands, but gives neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. Isn't that just beautiful? We can't do what the law asks of us, but we can fly because of the good news of the gospel. And this is what you and I proclaim. We proclaim this to ourselves. We proclaim this to other people in small groups and in big groups and in city groups and in family. We proclaim this to our community. We proclaim this to the world. Check this, last definition and then we'll be done. 
Proclaim means announce officially or publicly. That's what proclaim means. Or, different definition, to proclaim something means to indicate clearly. This is what we should do. We shouldn't be unclear or fuzzy about it. We should indicate it clearly. And this is the gospel that you and I proclaim. The fact that the grace of God saves us, it sanctifies us, and it sustains us. You are never beyond the need of God's grace. You are never beyond the reach of God's grace. We experience God's grace in three ways. Once for all, that moment of salvation. Again and again, that process of sanctification. And more and more, that sustenance that comes from getting to know God's grace. Amen. Thank you.